Hi and welcome to My Games TV. Today I want to cover the death of Immortals. So on this episode I'm going to analyze the Immortals year that we had in the LCS, talk a little bit about their strengths and weaknesses, um, and their kind of like epic failures, I guess you would say. Uh, epic only because they were so unexpected in a way. Um, and then I, I might talk a little bit about like culprits, villains, innocent bystanders, and not so innocent bystanders that have to do with them with the whole uh, the whole year. And so I want to I want to make sure that you guys know that I'm analyzing this, meaning that I'm trying to use uh, like the data that I see to kind of project and and guess at what's going on. So I'm not using any sort of like you know interior interviews or inside knowledge and when I am uh, then I'll certainly like share that kind of information so that you guys have the same analysis basis to stand on that I do um, and I'm not trying to like demonize anybody or anything like that so it's purely from the outside and I'm also not going to use any sort of like internal scrim information that we have like screaming against immortals mostly I'm looking at their games versus all of the opponents in the LCS and like um, and their performance in the in the playoffs. So, let me start off with what happened. First of all, Immortals came into the year, built a, a strong staff and a strong roster, competed in the first split, set an insane record, seventeen and one, I think, or something like that, uh, in best of ones. Went into this, went into the playoffs with a bye, uh, lost the semifinals match three zero, I think, to us to TSM, um, and then won the third and fourth place match. And then they went in the next split and had a repeat on their record, almost. Uh, they had two losses, and then, but they were in best of threes. So very, like, even more emphatic kind of exclamation point on their skill level. And then same thing, had a bye going into playoffs and went to the semifinals and got two threed by C9 and then won the third and fourth place match. And then eventually they lost the gauntlet to C9 again and ended up done with the season kind of early. Earlier than everybody expected, I would say. Okay, so let me start by talking about the first split, their strengths and weaknesses as a side. I think that coming to the first split, they displayed really clear strengths in terms of like proactive playmaking and side lane management. So by that I mean that like, you would look at their gold differential and their experience differential throughout the game, and you'd see that uh, even though they would have like a play that would like either work out equally or not work out, so they would they would either like trade objectives or they would trade kills. They would always end up ahead in terms of resources, whether it was experience or gold, because they were really good at um, creating tempo in a side lane or on a wave, even if it was mid, and then making a proactive play on their terms using that. And when they were making reactive plays, they were very good at, after the play was over, scraping resources from the map or um, or like kind of like triaging the play, I would say, uh, and like running elsewhere and making like a counter play somewhere else in order to get, in order to get uh, farmer experience. And the reason that, so there were, it's always a calculated risk when a team uh, kind of like maximizes farm in a side lane, whether or not they have tempo or whether or not they're ahead. And one of the things that can mitigate that is if your team plays like properly around the kind of pressure and either has a seesaw on the map, like when one side is, uh, is like being offensive, the other side is being safe. And Rainover in particular, I think, was really good at kind of being in the right place at the right time to... Um, proactively uh, defend their vulnerable side. So it was like less risky than it should have been because of that. And then other, otherwise also teams didn't punish it as much as they should have. And so that resulted in games where you'd see them like scrape large gold leads, even though they would be behind in objectives or behind in kills, uh, simply because they were better at farming. And their weaknesses in that split were more or less kind of like maybe compositional and macro related. So they had pretty linear compositions. They chose sometimes very difficult win conditions, win conditions that were much harder to pilot than like easier win conditions in their compositions. 
and um, for example, like straight up split push instead of like split push misses team fighting. Or sometimes I would see them run a composition that like just just didn't team fight very well um, because they didn't have a lot of CC, things like that. Um, and so they would rely a lot on skirmishing or like pure side laning to kind of like win games. And it worked really well, but it, I mean, obviously that's a weakness, you know, if, if a team can like hold that off, then they get to take advantage of their superior composition in a, in a straight up fight. Um, what other weaknesses did I see in the first split? Compositional, oh, kind of like sometimes not coming to the play too often. So sometimes like it would have been a more benefit to stay out of the play and just like continue pushing advantage elsewhere. And half the time they were good at that and the other half the time they committed to the play, which I don't really know if that's a weakness or just like a learning curve. Um, but yeah, okay. So let's jump up to split number two. I wanna go over the strengths and weaknesses there as well before I jump into the, the failures. So split number two, they do the same thing, but they have best of three formats. And one thing that I saw uh, as one of their strengths that was mitigated a lot from the first split was their drafts got a lot kind of like better. And I think it's because you're tested a lot more in the best of three format. Um, and so their compositions became a lot more like kind of, well, okay, the meta suited them a little bit more too, but their compositions became a lot more straightforward and they adapted really well to the meta. I think that they're, they went through two really nice meta shifts in the first split and then in the second, and then they failed one. And then in the second split, um, they went through one really nice meta shift to where they jumped from like uh, range to melee supports. Um, and yeah, and, and they shifted really well on those. Um, and their, their drafts, like I can remember multiple times where they straight up out drafted their opponents. Um, so their composition design was pretty good. And their, so their strengths remained the same. And their weaknesses, I would say, were, uh, again, like their cross map plays. So like there were a lot of times where I would see them commit to a play on defensive, defensively, when I think they should have been like, like seeding ground or seeding the, the resource and taking more on the other side of the map or taking an exchange or a trade because the other team just had tempo. But a lot of times they would, they would take the, the defense and the play and then they would just outplay them. But that's, you can kind of see that as weakness because like that works against teams where you can out execute, but then it starts failing against teams where you can't actually out execute on the defense and they have a numbers advantage or a tactical or a strategic or a tempo advantage on the play. So yeah, I kind of saw that as a weakness uh, when I was watching them on stage. But again, like it wasn't punished very much. Okay, before I jump into the analyzing their failures, I want to talk about their capability of being a world's team. So I think it is like absolutely true that they have capability of like being a world's team. I mean, if you just see some of the teams that are at worlds, like they're of the same caliber. Uh, I think that all of the teams that NA sent to worlds are capable of being a world's team. And so we just have enough teams in NA that like some of them can be world's teams and not go to worlds. And that's kind of a nice problem to have, I would say. Uh, but, you know, it's sad because um, I want to see all of the teams that I think could put up a good showing kind of on stage, and they're not going to get a chance to, which is disappointing. However, as, of course, a diehard CLG fan, which I can say now because we are all on the same side and we're not in the same group, um, and, of course, I'm... I'm TSM fan, a CLG fan, and a C9 fan, and an Immortals fan. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to see all of them kind of like playing on stage as well. Okay, so now let's jump into the failures. Failure number one, the split number one semifinal. So they go into this match against TSM, and they have a bad read in the meta, and I think, this is my analysis, this is my guess as to what's running through their heads, they're playing um, like a really punishing range top against... A, a tank that cannot like lane very well against range champions and they are snowballing that lead i'm imagining in the scrims what they did was they stomped lane and they snowballed that into uh, map advantage elsewhere and this is kind of like a uh, false positive because what happens is that this is this is kind of like the korean meta in a nutshell in my opinion you have a really strong kind of lane dominant like 
champion, and it, and it wins lane, but it doesn't provide as much to the composition, okay? And then we have the situation where uh, you pick a champion that like performs better in a composition or kind of like around the map or provide CC or which scales really well um, or, or scales better and has a weaker early game. And what happens generally, every single meta shift in League of Legends is that first you, you pick these lane dominant champions and then teams slowly get better at like defending against them, either playing safe or like choreographing defense around the map or obtaining vision in order to like not seed resources and still not die while these champions are nullified. And then you get to like a game that is very like safe, but then you have like better champions once the team fight start or the objective play starts. And this is generally like a better way to win the game because it's higher probability, lower risk, higher reward plays. And uh, it's, it's like when you have a composition that can win from various different like levels of the game, like let's say you don't get ahead in a snowballing comp, then all of a sudden you lose, right? Um, whereas there are compositions out there where if you get ahead, you're fine. And if you fall behind, you also can still win. And those are harder to play in terms of like choreography and defense, but they give you much more solid victory conditions once you kind of learn how to play with that kind of choreography. So the first and strongest comps that always come out of a meta are the kind where they just like stomp the with the OP champs until people learn how to play against them. And that's why you see like in um, in Korea always these like kind of like lanes that eventually survive. So instead of picking like super hyper carry champions in all roles, uh, or sorry, super bruiser champions in all roles that abuse lane like really hard, what we see is like the most possible abuse of the lane while still playing a champion that like is in the middle and can provide use in team fight, right? And you see compositions that are balanced between like one lane can be really strong, but then the other lanes are picked for safety or for like scaling or for things like that, right? So um, I think that when you train against inferior teams or teams that are worse at executing, you get false positives on snowballing comps and on things that snowball lane. And I remember a really funny interview last week with uh, Pobelta where they picked a Anivia to counter Soren in the post-game interview. Pobelter said, oh yeah, I just uh, hadn't played against any good Vladimirs um, that could like poop on my counter pick so hard. And that's kind of the way it is. Like you pick a comp that like, counters that like does really well and then all of a sudden you play against a team that's been training at surviving that phase and all of a sudden it doesn't work so i think that's what happened in the first game is they went with illusion and it didn't demolish top lane as much as they thought and so they couldn't snowball off of it really simple so then they adapted and i don't think they adapted particularly well because um the the interesting thing that i have struggled with as a coach is not when we change out champions, like a champion that plays differently in lanes, such as a tank or a bruiser or an assassin or whatever. The difficulty comes when we change out a role on a team. So like I have a top laner that has the go button, you know, and we train certain compositions where he's the go button all the time. All of a sudden, it's a meta where like the support has the go button instead of the backlining support. And then we have to relearn that like trigger, like everybody has to go when that person goes and that person has to see the same opportunities for engage as the other person used to. And that means that they have to like kind of step up to the plate and go through this learning curve and kind of this painful process of whatever. And then, um, and then let's say all of a sudden it shifts to the mid lane, like all of a sudden they have the, the Vladimir go button or something and uh, it, it is the one flanking because so you have this insanely tanky champion that for some reason is like in the middle of the mid lane uh, meta and all of a sudden that person has the go button and the team has to play around that uh, opportunity. So you, that's impossible to adjust to in the middle of a best of three. That's something you have to plan for like ahead of time. And I think that when they switched from somebody who wanted to jump kind of around freely in the back line while the rest uh, and like kind of like kill people while the rest of the team... Uh, defended like it seemed like they struggled with choreography of the of the other composition not with like actual play skill but just choreography and that's really tough because if you don't see it coming you kind of want to draft comfort so that you can actually play a composition that you know you can dance with on your team 
because you've drilled it so much. But then like what happens when it's not the best dance and you just have to hope that you can pull it off. Right. So that's one of the problems of prep is do you prep multiple different styles and try to teach that? Or do you all in on like the one skill that's like most important and hope that like it's, it becomes the dominant, you know, way of playing the game when you're, when you're on stage and stays that way. It's a big question. So that was their first failure. Uh, was that best of three or best of five? Fast forward to 12, 14, 16, however many weeks later, and same problem. They have a buy, just like we have a buy, and they don't get to test their ideas. Like there's a, there's a big meta change, and they have to kind of guess at what's meta, and then there's no possibility to test their ideas on stage because they have a buy. So they go all the way to the semifinals without a competitive match. Same as in the first split all the way to the semifinals without a competitive match. So there's no way to test and adapt and make sure that what you're doing is like correct against a, a team that's like on stage playing as if they're on stage. And we all know that in like scrims, people go more ham and are less focused and like play a lot safer and more scared on stage. And that's just the way it is. So that, that's a real detriment to like Immortals in both splits. And it kind of haunted us, in my opinion, as well, because I was really terrified of pulling in Immortals. I saw them have a buy. We didn't have a buy in the first split. So we got to go like all the way. We got to test our ideas on stage and then, you know, go face Immortals. And when we got a buy, I was super worried because it was the same thing. Big meta shift. And we have no like crucible or incubator to test our ideas. Of course, we get a nice benefit. We get to see what everybody else is doing and kind of steal from them, which is which is great. We don't have to reveal our cards. But um, yeah, I kind of prefer to go through the go through the mud than to like fly along in the clouds on the glider to the semis. But anyway, okay, so same situation. Immortals runs into the semis. And I'm going to make a little bit of a deal about the language that they use, but I want to make sure that you know that like I actually encourage my players to use similar language when they're talking to uh, reporters and stuff like that because I really like trash talk and I really like kind of like, mm, like that mentality. I just I just really like it. So Rainover does an interview with ESPN, which I read, and and he's already or maybe it was actually Red Bull. I don't remember which one. And he's like, they're about to go into the semifinals. He's already being asked questions about the finals against TSM. And like, that's the projected idea. And, you know, they're talking about it. And I was like, oh, that's so disrespectful to C9. But like, I would have my players do the same thing, you know, like confidence and kind of a braggadocia, which I like. Now, internally, internally, my philosophy is clouds and dirt. Sorry, clouds and dirt. So you have an ambition, right? But it's like way above just like this middling road. So like, I think that like when you're in the in the playoffs, like the finals is like, not high enough like you have an ambition above and beyond that you know like all-time greatest run in the history of league of legends for six years and inducted into the hall of fame right the clouds right winning the world championship in the next five years and the next year whatever and then you have the dirt which is your next game and the problem that a lot of people run into in execution is that they're standing there looking in the, at the horizon. They're like right there in the middle and they're looking at like something that's far away that they can't touch, but they can't, but they don't know how to get there. And, um, and they feel like they should be able to. And it's just like, it's in my opinion, a wasted focus. It detracts from your ability to concentrate on what you need to do. And it also detracts from your motivation of aiming high. So you kind of don't have the, the right amount of ambition, in my opinion. So internally, I'm sure, I'm hoping, I'm positive they were doing the same thing because if you look at their performance throughout two splits, it was really clear that they were focused on like strong ambition and that they had, uh, that they were working week to week, you know, to make sure that that was, that was the case. Um, so I just want to point out that like, although that language is there and I see it from the outside, they don't produce a reality TV show. So I can't see what they were talking about internally and make any guesses about that. Um, but just so you know, for your own personal use and coaching and everything, like focus on the clouds, focus on the dirt. What is the next thing you have to do? What is the next step you have to take right in front of you? Don't lift your eyes up to the horizon. It's too far up. What do you got to do right there? And where are you going eventually? Um, and, and like the middle part is going to change so much that I promise you, you'll have like no idea how in the world you ended up on the track that you did. 
don't try to plot your track to the horizon. Just like focus on your ambition and the, and the next step in front of you. Get it done. Okay, so anyway, they go into the semifinal versus Cloud9. It ends up being a, like a really bloody match. And I want to share a little trajectory that I saw happening throughout the split. We had two matches against C9. We had two matches against Immortals throughout the split. And if you go back and look at those games, one thing you'll notice is that Immortals pretty much had a gold lead um, in all three of their games in the first half of the split, like pretty early on. Sometimes a 700, sometimes up to 2K gold lead on us. Even if we were like kind of even in kills, they were they were uh, ahead in objectives and or ahead in uh, just farm. And um, that came a lot from the jungle position at that point. Right there was a beast. And, uh, and, and a little bit from the lane swap as well. Now, if you fast forward to the second match, it's a lot closer. But similar situation, we're more or less even in gold, right? Now, if you, if you go to the C9 matches, you see something very different in our first match against them. Um, you'll see that... Medios uh, is really good at counter map play. So we make a play, and he's on the other side of the map, like making a play to counter it um, or to, like, you know, do something reactive, proactive, but reactive. Kind of a good reaction because instead of like dying on, on like your half of the map uh, to the play or like not getting anything done, they're sitting there staring at them while you take your tower, you go do something, which is great. But it's, I think there's one point where kind of highlights what I'm talking about. Eight kills to eight kills, equal turrets, and they're down like 1.8k gold. And this is because we managed the waves and then made the made the play proactively. Um, and they were reacting. And so we got to like basically manage the farm better. And that's something actually Medios came on my stream halfway through the split and he was like, how do we beat TSM? I think... Um, things were not going well at that point. Or they were going well, you know, but, like, uh, they weren't going well against us. And uh, I was like, dude, you got to be proactive. Because at that point, he was a very reactive jungler in which he was, he was making really good counter plays, but they were always, like, on our timer. And if you look at a lot of C9's games, they would see what their, their kind of, like, opponents were doing, and they would react to it. And they would react really well a lot of the time. But it was still on their opponent's timer. So if you give that timer to a really good team, a really good team is going to take that timer and run with it all the way to the Nexus. And so fast forward to later in the split, you see the C9 games like in the finals and in the matches versus um, Immortals. And what you see is a lot more parity. You see C9 is making plays. They're proactive and they're doing the play on their timer. And all of a sudden... Like, this thing that Immortals is really good at. So Immortals is really good at doing the same thing. Making the play on their timer. Even against us, when we would make a play, they would make their play anyway. It frustrated me to no end. Because we'd be like, okay, we have the timer. Uh, that We're setting up this play. We set it up and we execute. And they're like, cool. We're also setting up our play. We're going to do our play also. And I was just like, no, you can't do that. That's, that's so annoying. But they did it anyway. Um, and, then, and then it's about, like, whose play is better or more thought out, or, like, whose defense is better, actually, in that case. Um, and a lot of times, like, it can, it's kind of a crapshoot. But, yeah, so C9 started doing that a lot more, and so all of a sudden, this team that I think used to be a lot lower than Immortals in terms of, like, uh, proactivity, like, caught up. And I think that Reaper was doing a really good job with, like, designing what objectives to fight for, what not to fight for, and compositions. I mean, if you just watch C9 throughout the split, you see more and more and more they're designing plays around specific, like, moments in the game and not just randomly fighting. And you see more and more that they're, like, kind of, like, drafting, like, really strong compositions all the time. Um, so I think that, and, and really similar ones, kind of repeatedly, right? Uh, so I think that, like, it would, there was clear progress in terms of like a vision. This is kind of like the Yamato Cannon style of coaching, right? The I would say real coaching, where you have a vision of how the game should be executed. Like I have a vision of how the game should be executed. Um, I believe fundamentally that uh, League of Legends is kind of like baseball and that there are like forced errors and unforced errors. 
and you need a you have a proactive nature of set plays that forces errors when you're in a position to capitalize on them and that's like just like game theory wise you know superior to uh like defensive play styles like zone defense because you can always put together a play that will crack a zone defense even if even, no matter how good the defense is um even if you go even on the defense they will have control of the play which means that they can like manipulate the resources of the play so that like uh, they get more out of the kind of like post play phase than you do. So yeah, so that's that's really important to me. And um, yeah, so back to their failure, they go against C9, and C9 bites back because they've been they haven't been screaming them I think for a week, right? Because it's like you don't want to scream your opponent the week leading up to the match. Maybe even it was longer than that. So C9 and Immortals have both just been screaming us and. Um, to be perfectly honest, I, I also put Immortals kind of over, over the top. I think everybody did. I think everybody, like even in the community was thinking like, yeah, Immortals is going to have a um, much better shot at this game and C9 scraped it out and they did it off the back of like super intense focused practice, uh, around like not caving essentially being proactive, playing the map well, drafting well. And they closed out a strong series. So I'm not really sure what the failure here was on Immortals' part. Maybe it was just the fact that they misread the meta. Because if you see in their games, they started off, I think, three games. They drafted very snowball-style compositions where they had kind of low levels of CC or, like, not as much CC. Or they maybe they drafted a the, uh, mid laner that, like, wasn't as uh, good in, like, late later game team fights if you were, like behind or even and sure enough they won a game i think they oh wait it wasn't a five game set was it, it was a four game set yeah no, no no it was a five game set in the semis it was the gauntlet that, that changed um gosh i should have reviewed the picks and bands before i jumped into this but anyway uh yeah they essentially i think like had to abandon their kind of like snowball draft and then they weren't as choreographed in you know in the last game they ended up actually didn't they like kind of choking draft stage and uh and end up with like lissandra top or something i think they knew lissandra was strong and they didn't know how to fit it in against their against the mid champion maybe um or like huni's just a really good lissandra player so maybe that made sense but yeah it didn't work out even though cc scales so well uh yeah so that was their second failure and, I mean, it just had to come out of prep, right? You have to prepare your first string composition, and it has to be, it has to obey game, like, basic game theory. Um, and then you, you have to run a gambit, like, do you prepare second string compositions, and what do they look like, and who are your, who do you train to, like, engage, and who do you train to make plays around the map, and who do you train to, like, uh, kind of, like, play different roles? Like, if you end up with a, a damage jungler instead of a tank jungler, then your team has to play completely differently in terms of how it's choreographed in fights and, and you know, around the map. So it, it can be really challenging and you have to, like, balance that kind of training. So it just didn't seem like they were prepped as well as C9 was. All right, so fast forward to failure number three, the gauntlet. Clearly they were doubting themselves, kind of leading into that, um, because they were pretty shaken, shaky. And I think... They weren't as confident. You know, they were super, super, super uh, focused on preparing, probably, for that match. And um, they won one game off of a snowballed top lane through Yasuo, which is a really good, like, secret pocket pick into Nar. And, um, yeah, Impact just kind of, like, carried the series. I mean, I don't think they were ready for the, like, the... 1v5 impact, SKT impact, or C9 impact, sorry, buddy, to show up in that series, and they didn't really know how to shut him down. Like, it, uh, it seemed pretty tough. It seemed like he was on fire, just in the zone, and he did, he did a lot of work. Then, yeah, the rest of the team just, like, played really well off of that confidence that he gave, and that kind of, like, maybe, like, silent, stoic leadership. 
And it's just so easy to win a game when you like you have one one lane that's just like automatically winning, and then all you have to do is like have one other winning lane, and that's it. And then you have like best two out of three, and and you can like snowball through those lanes. So it makes it it makes the game so much easier to play. All right, so that was the third failure. So now I want to go through like an analysis of kind of like all of the parties involved. So innocent bystanders. I'll start with that. I think the innocent bystanders are basically the players. Like I think that nowadays it's the staff's job to direct and and help players make the right decisions in terms of the game. Like if there's a champion and it's strong and a player doesn't want to play it, then I make them play it. Or if there's a player and he has to be an engage and he doesn't like know what to look for and he's not bloodthirsty enough and like he doesn't know like how to play with that champion and he'd rather play like a different one, then I put him on it and I tell him to engage like 5,000 times uh, nonstop every single game and we will pick apart all of his engages and we'll say this one was crap and this one was good and this one was crap and this one was crap and this one lost us the game and this one was good and your communication here was crap and step it up and stop failing and learn this thing. Um, and then they do. Surprisingly. It's not that surprising. You know it's going to happen. So you do. Um... So I don't think it's on the players to like force themselves through this because it's pretty tough. I think they're the innocent bystanders in this, more or less. I think they did a pretty good job. I was very impressed with them throughout the split and certainly when they were pooping on us all the time. That first series against Immortals was really hard. Okay, so the not-so-innocent bystanders. So we haven't got to the culprits and villains yet. The not-so-innocent bystanders, but bystanders nonetheless. Uh, I think Noah... Um, the CEO of Immortals. So, like, he's a Magic player, right? He played Magic the Gathering. My background's in Magic the Gathering. And I think that he did not do a critical... I don't think he did a good enough job crafting a critical environment to settle, like, core game theory disputes. So I saw clear differentiations between how I believe the game should best be played and how Immortals believes the best the game should best be played. Um, and I think that mine lines up more with Korea and Reaper. And I think that theirs lines up more with, like, not the highest highest chance to win with the lowest risk of losing, essentially. Um, and so, like, to create that, you have to craft a environment that can be very critical and settle these kind of disputes, like, in a, in a kind of professional way. And kind of also have, like, a driving, a strong fundamental basis for the driving theory of how the game should be played. Um, and then, of course, be able to confront, you know, people who disagree with that and, like, settle those disputes in, like, a logic-based argument manner or, like, just kind of like a uh, kind of a straightforward, this is the way that we see it manner, um, like a, you know, a guiding star or whatever. So that is an environment you have to make. And, of course, obviously that comes down to the person crafting the environment, so Noah. So innocent bystander in the process, but obviously not so innocent because he's technically directionally in charge of the thing. Uh, and then we have Robert Yip, who, really good friend of mine, amazing dude, and he's not a, like, game-centric coach, right? So I'm trying to remember Robert's background. I think it's, like, definitely rugby. Um, pretty sure he knows a lot about StarCraft 2, although I'm not confident on that. Um, I wonder if he's ever played any first-person shooters. But... There's been a marked shift, in my opinion, of like how sports psychology is kind of like used in sport. Um, I come from the fundamental belief, starting when I was a coach, that the best place in the world for sports psychological knowledge is within the coach himself. And that's why I was a coach. And I went and became a sports psychology trainer to kind of like incorporate those ideas into my coaching, to, to like become a better coach, right? But always as a coach. And I kind of got like sucked into being a sports psychology trainer because like nobody wanted to hire me for a gameplay coach and they couldn't afford me anyway as a gameplay coach or game centric coach because like I couldn't charge as much for that as I could for sports psychology and I wasn't confident in my game knowledge um, or my like game philosophy. Um, but if you look at like things like the Olympic volleyball team this year, what you see is this shift where the woman who is delivering sports psychology services for them was embedded within the team. 
And she was there on the court, and she was calling players over in between points and talking about, like, what their body language looked like to them. And it made me think of, when I read that article and I saw how different sports psychologists are being implemented in the Olympics this year, and I, and I compared that and contrasted it with, like, the NBA style where, yeah, there was one NBA guy who was, like, on the court, George Mumford, with, like, the Bulls and the Lakers, but other people were in offices, and it was, like, the player would, like, go to the sports psychology office and, like, talk to the person and then go back to the court. And I think that that's fundamentally, like, flawed. It's just like having a therapist or whatever. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with, like, how sport is enacted in life. And I remember in 2014 when I was, like, I've, I've been studying the game since, like, 2013, essentially, and in kind of, like, a very in-depth manner. And one of the first things I did was I would look at players' avatars, and I would try to read their body language, and I would try to see, like, are they in control of themselves when they're making this play? Is this an automatic play? Is it choking? So is it like they could do it, but they, they don't right here because of the pressure? Or is it that they're not good enough to do it? Um, are they hesitating or, are they, or do they not know what to do? Do they have something that they're like afraid of and they're acting on fear? Um, or is it that they're like confused, right? So all of these things can come through in body language. And this woman on the volleyball court like studied her players and knew the game and was able to like call them over and say like, like, look, you're not communicating with your team because you, uh, you double faulted on that serve or you, you failed that serve. And like that affected your next point because like this dive that you made was like half-hearted. You were half thinking, am I going to miss this too? And you weren't just like trusting yourself and trusting your team to like be okay with your mistake. And you weren't all in on the, on the flop, you know, on the jump. And so because your mind's in two places, thinking about the judgment of your team and the execution of the, of the play, you failed it, okay? That was not, it wasn't that you couldn't do it, it was that you were handicapping yourself. So I started being able to see that in the play of people on the rift. And I could see when, um, I guess it was in Copenhagen Wolves, <laughs> I could see when Young Buck, hi Young Buck, in top lane, you know, was getting dove and I could see when he was like under the pressure of the outplay and like choked, oh shoot. Or when he was like under the pressure of the outplay and he performed amazingly, but just couldn't outplay it, right? That he just wasn't good enough or they were just at numbers advantage and didn't work, right? So because there's, there's subtle differences in body language when that happens, like things just come more fluidly and automatic and aggressively versus like kind of hesitatingly in these little moments of hesitation and the kind of after effect uh, cocktail of expression um, that happens, you know, on the on the mouse and on the keyboard afterwards, you can kind of tell. So, fast forward, I think that, like, a coach should be able to do that, right? But if the coach can't do it, if the coach is, like, super philosophy-oriented, whatever, then the sports psychologist can kind of, like, start amplifying themselves in that direction, become a kind of person who can see that. And I'm not really sure where Robert is as far as that, because I haven't really talked to him in the last... Ever since he got the job, which is amazing, I was so excited for him when he got it, but I haven't really talked to him much about like League of Legends that much since then, or like I know that he knows he does an amazing job like handling their performance environment and helping them escalate themselves as far as performers and like physical maintenance and diet and nutrition and dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's, and I wonder if like they need that kind of like presence in game that takes everything that's done outside the game and like brings it on the rift, right? And can see when they're physically tilting on their teammates or like lacking trust and what it looks like in action. Uh, and I just don't know that. So I think Robert is like, a, is like an innocent bystander, right? But of course he's on the coaching staff. So that makes him a not so innocent bystander because even though it's not his purview, uh, it could be in his skill set. Um, okay, then we have the culprits, which of course is Dylan because he's the coach, right? So... In my book, uh, coaches are 100% on the line for performance outcomes. Players for growth outcomes, right? Players are on the hook for improving all the time and playing at their maximum potential and, like, not choking too much. Um, and if they're not good enough to hack it, then they're not good enough to hack it. Like, as long as they're always getting better, then um, that's what I hold players up to, like, in terms of, like, what their task is and when, when they fail... Uh, it's not the performance outcome like losing the game. It's like, did they perform better than they could have? Did they perform at the top of their peak? And if not, then they then they short performed. And um, I'm okay with losing if players are like always 
like performing at their peak or close to their peak or like getting better all the time, right? So then performance outcomes on the coach. And like, that's something that I put on myself. So I told them that when I was hired, you know, I said like, hold me to task for performance, reward me if we win, punish me if we lose. Don't pay me if we lose, pay me if we win. Um, and I think in traditional sport, this is even more the case because you can build the roster. Like as a coach, you get to put the roster together. So not only do you scout out the talent and say like this person, yes, this person, no, but also you get to develop that talent and then you also get to engineer the path of the team. So it's like even more the case in traditional sports. So it's not yet the case in eSport completely because you don't typically see coaches like throwing their rosters together. Um, although maybe in Immortals that did happen. I'm not really sure how, like in what order they hired everybody. Um, you get to scout the talent, throw the roster together, choose the direction of the team, hold them to that direction and conform everybody to their roles and then train them and have a system of training that like cr that like crosses all the T's and dots all the I's in terms of like everybody's capabilities and adaptation to an ever-changing game. So obviously that's the head coach's purview. And so unfortunately that's makes Dylan the culprit. Um, okay, now the villains. That would be TSM and C9. <laughs> Or more specifically, Parth and I and Reaper. So, sorry, Immortals, we're the villains in this because we F'd you over in semifinals and then C9 F'd you over in semifinals in the gauntlet. And sorry, we're the bad guys in this. I apologize for being better. Oh, on that day. Better on that day. Which, of course, in sport, is the only thing that matters. It's being better on that day. Uh, feels bad and feels good at the same time because there's nothing better in the world than seeing wild turtle smile and there's nothing more painful in the world than seeing wild turtle sad because uh, you know they're cute little wild turtles and uh, they're just so adorable so yeah that's my analysis of the death of immortals for the split obviously they're a phoenix so they will rise from the ashes they are sorry they're immortal so they will just stand up again um, they weren't they weren't actually killed like I said they're mortals they didn't die um, and I'm sure they're gonna be back with the same kind of thing like if you if you can do it once it's uh, I guess you know a fluke or an accident but they were able to do it two splits in a row and um, I think that Noah's gonna be able to pull it off again next year and we'll see oh geez Shh. sorry this is my phone. Time to get moving, I guess. Yeah, so we'll see if they can pull it off again next year, but I have pretty good confidence that they can. They uh, they have a lot going for them in terms of like Noah's ability to uh, construct a team and construct a staff to put the team together. And uh, he clearly knows what he's doing on the business side since they're doing really well in terms of their like, you know, media production and merchandising production and good luck guys can't wait to see you at worlds in 2017 oh right this show is brought to you by mac program there's my ad the mac program become a mindful warrior this is um this is uh, where I don't get to advertise other people's stuff because I make my own thing. So if you want this, I've been working on it for three years. It's in its third version. It is. Uh, it was on a different website which collapsed and I lost all of the handouts, but I, got, I kept all 47 of the days of the videos. So it's 47 discrete lessons, each of them 15 to 25 minutes long, sometimes 30, that involve a mindful lesson, like a mindful meditation or a mindfulness session, plus kind of a lecture or um, a topic. And it's about essentially uh, resilience. So resilience in your pursuit of whatever it is. So I gear it obviously towards uh, elite performance in eSport, but you can use it for, I use it for school, for work, for life, for relationships, uh, for being just a better person in general. This is what it's all about for me, is being able to like endure live by my values instead of my emotions. So instead of being driven by emotions to be driven by a set of values that kind of like drive your behavior in, in a direction that you can take small steps every day with resistance to whatever it is that's trying to stop you internally, whether it's fear or 
procrastination or boredom or frustration or like uh, like non surety about like your situation and where you're headed. And instead, you can just like move forward living in the moment. So that's what that whole program is about. And it's really expensive right now because I lost all the worksheets. So I think there's like 12 worksheets that I developed to go along with it and they kind of went down with the website and I'm slowly adding them back in. But in the meanwhile, you can lock it in at this price right now, which I think is $25 and you have permanent access because it's that kind of thing. It's like a login, right? So right now you just have the core of it, which is like all 47 different like daily lessons, which you can do like five of them a week, three of them a week, seven of them a week, whatever you're able to do. Don't do like 14 of them a week. It's supposed to be once a day max. Um, and uh, and that is where the actual neurological change will happen. So it's designed after a program that has been, that was innovated in 2004 and like tested a lot since then. And this is my third version of like crafting it in video form. Um, but the fundamental research in it shows like pretty strong structural changes in your neurons after uh, essentially 12 weeks um, or, or sooner if you finish it sooner than that. But essentially like eight cumulative hours of mindfulness training results in the kind of structural changes that show up on things like MRI scans. And that's the basis of this program. So that's where like the, the actual physical change takes place. And the rest of it is, um, is kind of like more personal about like setting your own values and self-awareness and understanding what it is you want. But in the meanwhile, you can get kind of like the foundational behavior things out of the way in how you're able to control and like be okay with not being able to control also your life and your emotions. So yeah, check that out. It supports me, supports what I do, supports my program, uh, supports this broadcast, supports my family. And uh, oh, not yet, though, just supporting my business at the moment because it's not really like a successful enough business to support a family yet, but maybe at some point. Uh, also, my reading list, which I'm like editing like literally right now. Don't have it ready yet, but uh, it's if you if you go to the link, I think maybe there's even not a link yet. I'll try to get it up by the end of the day. Then you can subscribe and then you'll get the full reading list like one by one with my reviews on each book and article and then I'll just like keep updating that so you might get a new email like every week or so with a new thing that I find interesting to read um, like synopsis I'll give you send you a synopsis and a review and you can check it out if you want and finally the five minute journal which is something that I use every single day with um, with the team and with pretty much every team that I've ever worked with the Mac program also by the way I used with CLG and TSM and the five minute journal used with both of them only in my own form like I just have them kind of do it uh, you know, on blank paper or whatever like that because I designed the activities. But the five-minute journal is a nice, concise, like, put-together version of that, uh, that, that journaling that I have them do every day, the gratefulness conditioning. So you can check those out in the links down below, and I will see you guys next time.